good afternoon. Welcome to today's colloquium. Hello. Um, I have a couple of announcements to make before we start. Um, next week's um, colloquium will be delivered by Mandela Fellow Christopher Umer, and he'll be speaking on contemporary small magazines and black internationalism, corridors of storytelling. And please join um, Britta Walshmith Nelson on November 8th tomorrow at 4 p.m. at the Hip Hop Archive as she speaks on From Swatsika, Swatsi, Swatsika to Jim Crow, German Jewish Refugee Scholars in the Southern U.S., 1938-1965. Now please welcome to the podium Alejandro de la Fuente, Professor of History and African American Studies and Director of the Afro-Latin American Research Institute here at Harvard. Well, good afternoon. Um, it is, of course, my duty, but also my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Mary Hicks, who is the Mark Mam uh, Cluster Mammalian <coughs> Fellow at the Du Bois Institute this year. For those of you who may not know, uh, Mamolin was a childhood friend of Professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. and he was uh, he served on the center's advisory board until his uh, rather premature death in 2013. His generous bequest supports several initiatives in Afro-Latin American studies at the Hutchins Center, including the fellowship that supports Mary's exceptional work. Currently an assistant professor of black studies and history at Amherst College, Mary graduated from the University of Virginia. She obtained her PhD at the University of Virginia in 2015 in Latin American history. And she had there the opportunity to work with a rather exceptional, and I would say unique mix of scholars. Unique because this group included prominent Africanists, such as Joe Miller, included uh, prominent Latin Americanists, such as Brian Owenson, and then included prominent people in the middle, <laughs> prominent Atlanticists, such as Rocinaldo Ferreira, who was still there at the time. I could see echoes of each of these scholars in Mary's proposal when I read it months ago, but I could also see that her book manuscript, Captivity's Commerce, Black Mariners and the World of South Atlantic Slavery, 1721-1835, has the potential to make a radical, innovative intervention in the recent and rather good scholarship about Atlantic Africa, the South Atlantic, and the slave trade. I am talking about a rather distinguished body of work that perhaps inaugurated with John Thornton's Africa and Africans in the Making of the Atlantic World which was published back in 1992, now includes important contributions by Robin Law, Christine Mann, James Sweet, Roginaldo Ferreira, Mariana Candido, and more recently, Jessica Crook. Yeah. These scholars have already transformed how we think about slavery and the slave trade in Africa and the Americas. Thornton, as you know, convincingly demonstrated that Africans were active participants in the Atlantic trade and refuted the notion that they were at the mercy of European traders. Law and Mann demonstrated that in the mid 19th century, uh, commercial and reciprocal cultural influences between Brazil and the slave coast were of such intensity that coastal communities such as Lagos could not be even understood outside of those uh, relationships. Then people like Ferreira and Candido developed this approach further arguing that the South Atlantic constitutes, in fact, a singular and shared historical uh, space. Or, as Roginaldo puts it, that Brazilian history is an integral part of Angolan history and vice versa. Ferreira, by the way, uses this approach to place Africans now at the center of 19th century abolitionism. Mm -hmm. In his forthcoming book, the Costs of Freedom, Central Africa in the Era of Abolition, 1820-1880, which will be published by Princeton University Press in 2019, and I highly recommend this book. 
What Higgs adds to this rather illustrious body of work is the first serious examination of the maritime dimensions of the African diaspora. Africans, she tells us, were important not only as suppliers on the African end or as consumers of European products on the African end or as social, economic, and cultural actors on the Americas end. Africans were also important in the middle. They were key actors in the organization and functioning, in fact, of the Middle Passage. By concentrating on the seafaring activities of enslaved Africans and of free and freed blacks, many of them criollos, creoles born in Brazil, Hicks offers a novel historical reconstruction of Portuguese colonization and of oceanic commerce from the perspective of the enslaved and freed Africans who fundamentally reshaped the transatlantic maritime world that they inhabited. As she will probably tell us today, and all I know is what I read in her proposal about this because I have not read her dissertation, their numbers were not precisely low. I was actually surprised by how high those numbers were. This study of slaves in motion will transform how we conceive, how we think about the slave trade, and also will challenge how we think about enslavement. What does it mean to be enslaved when you are moving constantly and you have the opportunity you land in, on the African coast. How does the presence of enslaved workers in slave ships shape our understanding of this infamous trade? By centering on the activities of these maritime workers, Hicks also reminds us of something that we know, but that we frequently forget, that the development of the African diaspora was a multi-directional process, one characterized by the constant movement of people, ideas, cultures, and products across the sea both ways. It is because of her innovative work that Mary has received numerous fellowships and awards, more than I can mention here. And it is because of the promise of this work that I will end with a request, which is also an offer. I do not know what are your plans for the manuscript, <laughs> but I'm going to urge you to consider submitting it to the Afro-Latin America series at Cambridge University Press which I have the pleasure of, ed of editing with my colleague, George Reed Andrews. And I say that because this book represents a major contribution to Afro-Latin American studies. And I think I am entitled to assure you that the proposal will be welcome <laughs> there. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Professor Mary Hicks. <laughs> I should begin by saying I've never had an introduction that generous with a book offer attached to it, so thank you. <laughs> um, uh, uh, thank you very much, <laughs> Professor De La Fuente. Um, I'd really like to um, thank Professor Gates um, for having me at the Hutchins Center this year. Also Krishna, who's been invaluable um, and a wonderful um, person to work with. And of course, all the fellows who I found to be it's such an a, a intellectually enriching environment, um, more than I could have imagined before I came. So just thank you, and everyone, uh, to everyone who's here, thank you very much for coming to see my talk. Um, so I want to begin in 1739. This is the moment when Juan Josef, a freeborn black mariner from Havana, living in Sao Tome, which, for those of you unfamiliar, to me is right here in the Batavini. <clears throat> Petition the Portuguese Overseas Council, appealing to the piety and clemency of the king to rectify, quote, the insult to one of his vassals. Joseph demanded to be reimbursed for what he called his pains and injuries that had been inflicted upon him by Domingos Luis Coelho, who had usurped the, quote, liberty he had always possessed. Juan followed by recounting the tumultuous and in many ways remarkable years leading to his legal entreaty. He explained that he had come to the island after being enslaved by an English ship on a voyage from the Caribbean to Corsica. Eventually, he escaped to Sao Tome, quote, in order to be in a Catholic kingdom, which he's always professed the Catholic faith and has always kept him safe. There, Joseph was imprisoned by local officials and delivered to Pastor Manuel Luis Coelho, who held Juan and his Carta de Euphoria, or manumission letter. Soon Coelho had passed away, 
And it, it was in this relative serenity of the Portuguese colony that Juan Josef remained, as he termed it, in liberty, without the dependence of a captive and living a financially independent life. So after Manuel Luis Coelho's brother Domingos arrived on the island, he hid Juan's Carta de Euphoria and imprisoned Juan in a private cell in his home. He claimed that Josef was his property, and in the following months, Juan existed in a state of continuing torment, as he termed it. As Coelho attempted to sell the man to various buyers, Josef always protested that he was free, a gambit which was initially successful in thwarting Coelho's plans to sell him. Eventually, Juan was sold to a French captain, um, and he labored on this ship for two years. Eventually, he arrives in the ports of what he terms the Kingdom of France. And there, he was advised by his Catholic confessors before he fleed to London and then to Lisbon. So we see here his route um, that he takes during the course of his um, odyssey from, from freedom to slavery and back again uh, to freedom. So once he returned to Sao Tome, José, or sorry, uh, Joseph petitioned the crown to punish Coelho, who had since returned to Rio de Janeiro with the help of the colony's oviador, who corroborated, surprisingly, Joseph's story. Though no resolution exists to Juan's petition in the archives, his odyssey suggests a South Atlantic world that was both dynamic and perilous for people of African descent. African and Creole mariners, that is, people of African descent but born in the Americas, such as Juan navigated the porous boundaries of European seaborne empires and demonstrated the recurrent ability of such cosmopolitan actors to move between them. Partaking in an unprecedented degree of geographic mobility, black mariners facilitated commerce by acting as intermediaries between slave traders, African merchants, and enslaved people. They diffused knowledge of emancipatory Portuguese royal law to enslaved people throughout the empire, and they introduced West African-derived material cultures and medicinal knowledge to the urban communities of colonial Brazil. Path-breaking works by Paul Gilroy and Catherine McKittrick have highlighted the multiple and contested meetings of black movement during slavery, arguing that people of African descent created counter -geogra geographies and counter modernities through subversive mobility. But because of scant historical study, the particularities of the South Atlantic spaces, West Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, the first oceanic geographies to host black movement have yet to be teased out. So my findings demonstrate that the South Atlantic was in many ways a counterpoint to North Atlantic spaces. So be beginning in the 15th century, and this is a, a later depiction, but um, it illustrates a general point, right? Beginning in the 15th century, black waterborne mobility underpinned Portuguese oceanic exploration and settlement. African and Creole seamen not only provided the physical labor necessary to man the central machine of Portuguese commerce, in the early modern world, the oceanic uh, sla sailing ship, they also furnished captains with the critical skilled labor, including navigational, commercial, and medical expertise that was necessary to make sea travel in the Atlantic a reality. Iberian ships plying West African coasts for slaves depended on expert Portuguese-speaking Biafada and Banyun uh, Grimets, drawing from seafaring West African communities who acted as navigators, sailors, and cultural brokers. By the end of the 15th century, ships operating outside of the Atlantic had also begun to use African mariners as an integral part of their labor force. Vasco da Gama's voyage to India in 1489 uh, was home, uh, sorry, 98, sorry, was home to enslaved servant, uh, an enslaved servant of the pilot who quickly escaped when the vessel anchored in East Africa. By 1579, uh, black slaves were acting as Portuguese translators um, on vessels traveling to China. They were also sailors in the Indian Armada. So we see here, this is a, a depiction of a, a ship traveling to Japan, but it just gives you a sense, right? You see um, here sailors who are African descent uh, on this Portuguese vessel. Um, so nowhere was black maritime culture more vi vibrant than in Brazil and particularly in Salvador Bahia, which was the heart of the Portuguese empire. It was also the third largest slave trading entrepot in the Atlantic world, and it was also one of the busiest ports in the Americas. So their highly mobile and cosmopolitan mariners strategically leveraged their ability to successfully operate 
in the disparate cultural milieus of West Africa and Bahia to limit their own marginalization, facilitate greater autonomy from their owners. Both locally and globally oriented, black mariners inhabited multiple social worlds. Unlike the seafarers of Paul Gilroy's Black Atlantic, however, their cosmopolitanism was oriented to Africa, not to Europe. And their mobility remained less a challenge to Portuguese expansion than a necessary precursor to it. In the South Atlantic, the movements of Africans and their descendants did not comprise a counter geography so much as a prevailing one. Enslaved African watermen were the first to achieve mastery over the local hydroscapes of the Bay of All Saints, which we can see pictured here. And this is, um, this is the city here. They pioneered adaptations to the aquatic environment. They formulated techniques of navigation and extraction of aquatic resources. They monopolized the maritime labor necessary to convey goods and people from the plantation landscapes of Bahia to um, the city of Salvador. They piloted canoes, rafts, lighters in between rural and urban communities. You can see this is a depiction um, in a city just north of Bahia, but it's a similar principle. African-born fishermen alongside enslaved women and children supplemented poultry rations through the cultivation of what I term aquatic provisioning grounds. So see, here we can see the depiction of that as well. Adding sufficient protein to their diets through the collection of discarded whale meat, the construction of fish pens, and the collection of shellfish at use of fruck shorelines. Within the port by the late colonial period, though enslaved people comprised 44% of the city's population and free blacks 11%, nearly all local watermen were of West African descent, um, both enslaved and free. Often, the oft complex relationship that early modern Africans had with the sea entangled them not only in the imperial politics of Portugal, but ultimately in the transatlantic slave trade. My research on the history of African and Creole mariners in the Bahian slave trade begins in 1721, as Portuguese merchants reestablish a territorial presence on the West African coast by erecting a trading fort in Ouida. They were fed by a robust demand for enslaved labor in Brazil, driven principally by sugar and tobacco plantations in the region, as well as the recent discovery of gold and diamond deposits in the interior. Merchants progressively intensified slave trafficking in multiple ports in the Bight of Benin, from Elmina to Lagos. So we see here that the region where they're most active, the Portuguese are, are most active, is this region here. Consequently, the number of slaving voyages traveling from Salvador de Bahia in northeastern Brazil uh, rapidly proliferated, necessitating an expanding labor force to man and operate the many corvettes, brigs, galleys, and other vessels plying the intensifying transatlantic trade. By the 18th century, the growing demand for mariners of any stripe compelled captains and merchants to increasingly employ um, free and enslaved African and Creole mariners in a variety of seafaring occupations. As a growing number of these men traversed the Atlantic as deep water sailors, they utilized their mobility and frequent travel to the Imperial Metropole in Lisbon to access legal authorities whom they hoped would resolve the injustices committed against them. Indeed, the narrative of Juan Josef suggests the various ways that black maritime Atlantic life afforded a range of possibilities unavailable to the vast majority of enslaved Africans in the New World. Juan Josef's petition and those of many men like him reveal how black mariners conceptualized Atlantic spaces as well as their place within them. Juan's rhetoric indicated that he understood the Atlantic not as an amorphously undifferentiated zone, but rather as in fact constituted by distinct royal and religious realms of authority and also connected by uh, what I term sanctuary ports. Juan several times evokes his attempts to gain access to Catholic kingdoms and contact fellow Catholics. Though he frames such choices in the language of religious devotion, they also belie the strategies that Juan himself saw as best assuring his liberty. In essence, he was articulating what I term jurisdictional consciousness, a modification of Herman ben Bennett's term legal consciousness, which entailed the development of a spatially defined legal imaginary among enslaved black mariners. Scholars such as Brian Owensby and Alejandro de la Fuente and others have argued that Iberian law inflected with Roman and civil, civil and uh, Catholic ecclesiastical precedent favored the ideal, if not the practice, of freedom and endowed enslaved people with the legal standing to litigate in court. This was a right which was glaringly absent in British common law, 
which only recognize enslaved people as property, not persons. So ultimately, the effectiveness of Juan's legal strategy lay in his jurisdictional choices. Over the course of a number of years, he ably navigated maritime Atlantic, um, the, sorry, a maritime Atlantic comprised of competing legal realms. Eventually, he was able to locate one that was most favorable to his aspirations. And he also drew on information he had gathered from other men like himself, cosmopolitan slaves. After the 1761 adaptation of, or adoption of a royal edict which liberated any slave which landed on Portuguese soil, um, the phenomenon of black mariners who tried to achieve manumission by traveling to Lisbon grew exponentially. In 1780, for instance, four enslaved African men and one woman aboard the ship Santissimo Sacramento petitioned the Royal Board of Trade in Lisbon in order to, quote, claim their freedom. In contradiction to the law's explicit purpose, which was to prevent Africans from traveling to the metropole, essentially it was, it was the purpose of the law was to keep enslaved Africans in the, in the colonies and not the metropole, the legal representative of the group instead argued that the animating principle of the law was to, quote, address the benefit of the liberty of slaves. The law transcended the boundaries of empire. In 1791, two black sailors arrived in Lisbon on a French ship seeking manumission through the statute. Several decades later, African sailor Jose Manuel jumped ship from a Brazilian vessel in Porto and traveled to Lisbon. He quickly made his way to a Catholic brotherhood housed in the Igreja do Salvador, and in order to be catechized and baptized there, Jose hoped that such a maneuver would ultimately liberate him from slavery. These examples reveal the engagement of enslaved mariners with Portuguese imperial legal systems through the creation of petitions, as well as their novel interpretation of established juridical concepts, including Catholic sanctuary, descent from a free womb, um, prescription, which is the sort of statue of liber limitations on claiming somebody who ostensibly is acting free as an enslaved person, as well as the principle of free soil. So these petitions reveal the myriad ways in which mariners reformulated these principles to construct their own notions of liberty. The ability to move transformed the experience of slavery for those who could access the fluid currents of information, commerce, movement, and culture which characterized Atlantic spaces. The growing number of manumission petitions proliferating in Lisbon is indicative of how enslaved people's maritime travel facilitated long distance informational networks, similar to the kind as analyzed by Julius Scott in his work on the 18th century Caribbean. The regularity with which enslaved men and women evoked the law of 1761 illustrates that mariners had been central in diffusing information about favorable Portuguese law throughout the Luso Atlantic. As one colonial administrator lamented, the law had liberated so many slaves that no enslaved artisans remained to perform the necessary labor to keep Brazil's agricultural production operational. Though this was likely an overstatement. Um, <laughs> furthermore, he noted that it was not the newly arrived filled hands from Africa who had escaped using the protection of said law, but it was in fact the quote, most acculturated and attentive slaves who had the greatest propensity to run away. Enslaved people's effectiveness in utilizing the law was epitomized by the Viscount of Ana Diaz claim that masters were often absent at such, such hearings, and that the colony of Brazil had irrationally begun to merely import Africans so that they could turn around and free them immediately. Uh, of course, this was also, uh, I believe, an overstatement. Um, but in addition, many mariners' interpretations of the law's applicability to their own situations afforded uh, innovative justifications, right, for their own manumission, right? So they always push beyond the sort of boundaries uh, of, of the strict legal code. They coded themselves as loyal subjects. In the words of historian Mariano Candido, insiders worthy of benevolent protection of the monarch, and as such, they highlighted their value to the Portuguese empire, evoking their commercial or naval service, their original liberty, or birth to a free room. They also evoked the ca Catholic principle of sanctuary or protection by drawing on the monetary and intellectual resources of black Catholic brotherhoods in Lisbon. They accentuated their Catholic piety and uh, through the taking of sacraments and they emphasized their integration into a larger global community of Christianity and thus civilization. Furthermore, many enslaved petitioners contended that a man's natural condition was in fact freedom and that the law as such, should ideally favor that state. 
So though it might be tempting to view Juan Josef and others like him as exceptional actors in the early modern Atlantic, I in fact argue that enslaved mariners were fundamental to the growth and functioning of the South Atlantic slave trade between the Bight of Benin and Salvador de Bahia. So I have quite a bit of demographic work, so if you are not fascinated by this kind of thing, uh, I I'm sorry, but uh, this is essentially laying out well, what is the demographic basis for making the claim that the slave trade depended on this, on this kind of labor, um, which is very counterintuitive. So for instance, a 1775 census from Bahia revealed that about 40% of uh, over 1,000 seafarers laboring on long distance voyages were Preto or African, um, and that 35% were enslaved. So local administrators noted that on long distance Bahian vessels, quote, the majority of all their crews are composed of many enslaved blacks. Tell people what preto means. Oh, pre preto means black, right? right? But oftentimes it was used um, uh, to indicate African, African born. Um, so the majority. Enslaved. Oh, yeah. Creole. It's not like mixed people because it's worse. Yes. Work. Yes. Yes, exactly. So it's. It, people, black women are expected to get mixed up. Just to be explained that. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, so Creole essentially may, it, it, Criollo in Portuguese, is a person who is of African descent, full African descent, but born in uh, the Americas. Right, sure. So, so the majority of all, so according to this census, the majority of all their crews are composed of many enslaved blacks due to the great lack of white sailors. With the greatest concentration of these men serving on the 24 slaving ships regularly traveling to West Africa, which were, quote, accustomed to equip with a small number of four to six white sailors, supplying black captives for the rest of the majority that go. So a second demographic snapshot of Salvador's maritime population emerged from my combination of the sh ship papers of 52 Bahia enslaving vessels, which were captured by British anti-slaving forces between 1811 and 1829. So by compiling this data, I've calculated that between 1811 and 1829, 36% of all mariners were African born, 10% were Brazilian born, but of full or partial African descent, and 28% were enslaved. So in comparison to estimates of the racial composition of maritime labor force in the North Atlantic, for instance, for which scholars have argued that black sailors comprise only a tiny portion of ship crews, black mariners in Bahia remained the majority from the last quarter uh, of the 18th century to the first half of the 19th century. So further analysis of the composition of slaving ship crews reveals that additional startling distinctions in, reveal additionally startling distinctions in Bahian uh, sailing culture. So for instance, of the 501 African-born sailors laboring in the slave trade, 79% are from the Bight of Benin. Um, and this is the region where most slaving voyages were destined. So this is a higher proportion than the general population of enslaved people from the Bight of Benin in Bahia. So this indicates essentially that merchants, slaving merchants purposefully employed men from this region on slaving vessels going to the region. So crucially, the linguistic and cultural knowledge of West African mariners derived from their origins made them attractive laborers in the slave trade. So in contrast to their Brazilian and European born counterparts, they could converse with captives in the cargo. They could also act as trade auxiliaries on the West African coast. So for instance, when African sailor Antonio Lopez um, petitioned his owner for, uh, to recuperate wages, he argued that he had worked as both, quote, a barber and a general interpreter uh, in the slave trade in 1784. So like ship merchants, imperial authorities were convinced of the efficacy of enslaved mariners, especially on slaving voyages. So in 1777, the Board of Trade informed the captain of the Partelmiel that upon arriving in the African port of Benguela, he should, quote, get rid of the white sailors and substitute them with black sailors who are more experienced with this kind of trip and dealing with slaves. Writing two decades later, a Danish traveler testified to the influence the black mariners exercised uh, over in, in controlling um, enslaved people held in cargoes. So in his travelogue, he related that those slaves who know the method of treatment on the Portuguese ships, quote, show little fear. They see that their comrades, meaning other Africans, often come back to the coast as sailors and conclude that the condition of all of them is equally fortunate. Continuing, he noted that the slaves on the Portuguese vessels from Brazil were, quote, treated most mildly of any nation slave trade. Only a very few of them are chained in the hold. Most of them are on deck and to a degree mingle with the crew. So equally important 
to Mariner's linguistic and cultural dexterity was their fluency in Portuguese language and custom. Right? So oftentimes, enslaved sailors were referred to as Ladino, which means enculturated. <clears throat> These men were also quite a bit uh, cheaper to employ um, than free mariners, right? Um, so for instance, enslaved common sailors earned 43 mil hayaish on the average voyage, while free black sailors earned 58 hayaish. The average for a white sailor, meanwhile, was 81 hayaish, mil hayaish. So substantially more than either group. Conversely, however, average wages for crew members were strongly correlated with rank, occupation, and corresponding level of skill, experience, and responsibility. So this aspect of the Bayan trade, in contrast to the North Atlantic, did not restrict black mariners to low-ranking positions, right? So Jeffrey Bolser argues that black sailors had, quote, little authority on uh, North Atlantic vessels. But in contrast, on Brazilian vessels, Enslaved men uh, and even African men regularly served as officers. So Africans virtually monopolized the position of medical practitioner on slaving ships, representing nearly 90% of all barbers, sangredores, which means blood letter, uh, and surgeons. Black coopers were responsible for building and maintaining barrels, made about 79% of all registered um, for that occupation. And Africans and Creoles also comp comprised the majority of cooks at 77%. Right? The only um, position that they did not really hold was that of captain um, or pilot. Um, even though at the end of the uh, 19th century, you have a number of mixed race or pardo men being employed as slaving ship captains and merchants. So the great variety of skills that were required to run the complex machinery of the slaving vessel provided ample opportunities for specialization and advancement, even for enslaved African mariners. As my analysis reveals, racial discrimination did impose restrictions on what kind of occupations black seafarers were allowed to gain entry to. It also depressed their compensation for similar work. That said, the fluidity of shipboard life allows skilled and experienced African seamen to access unparalleled opportunities in colonial slave society. On a single slaving vessel such as the Desengano, for instance, an enslaved African sangrador could earn twice the wages of a free white sailor. Um, so this essentially indicates that race was not an all-determining factor in structuring labor and social relations at sea. Enslaved mariners, as one type of escravo de gano, which is essentially a wage-earning wage slave, could also accumulate wealth during the course of the transatlantic voyage. They could accumulate wealth both for their owners and for themselves. So slaveholders who employed their slaves as wage-earning mariners exchanged the prospect of receiving ha handsome incomes for the risk that enslaved sailors would either escape or die during the course of the voyage. So owners who hired out their slaves earned an average of 10 to 20% profit on their initial investment of the slave's purchase price, making it a very lucrative form of slaveholding in Brazil's urban centers. So you think about it as sort of um, an accumulating asset that you don't really have to do much Two, I mean, it's just accumulating um, money while you know, the enslaved sailor is traveling around the ocean and you don't really have to oversee it or do anything, unlike um, the, the form of slaveholding that you see on a, on a plantation, which is he heavily surveilled. So the promise of profit incentivized many slaveholders to grant their slaves greater autonomy, allowing them to live outside of their household and labor in the absence of direct supervision. So additionally, the financial underpinnings of the Bayan slave trade unlike that of the North Atlantic, which favored um, joint stock companies or other financial instruments, was predicated on a form of short-term collective investment derived from the medieval Mediterranean comenda. Right? So this is a sort of financial instrument in which space on the cargo hold was divided into shares or lots or prasas. Right? Thus, a financially viable cargo commonly drew on as many as 40, 40 investors right, and profits were broadly distributed throughout Salvador's population. Um, this form of financial organization provides a stark contrast to what we see, for instance, in Manolo's Florentino's portrait of capital concentration in the slave trade of 19th century Rio de Janeiro. So sailors could also invest on slaving voyages. They se could secure a personal liberty chest, or Caixa, Caixa de Liberdade, which was a portion of the ship's cargo, essentially. 
And often they would receive this in lieu of monetary compensation or in addition to it. The holdings of such liberty chests could be extensive. Black mariners, even the enslaved, could thus participate in the Atlantic trade. In particular, black mariners focus on trade in West African commodities to be sold to enslaved men and women living in Bahia. Thus, black mariners were key links in a transatlantic commodity trade comprised of goods produced, transported, marketed, and consumed by Africans and their descendants on both sides of the Atlantic. So perhaps the only commodity, so perhaps this is the only kind of commodity circuit of its kind in the Atlantic world at the time, right, that is, you know, so heavily controlled by people of African descent, right? So this black commodity trade was driven by notions of African-derived materiality as particularly socially and ritually potent. So for instance, freed African ship barber Antonio Gomez purchased 90 panos da costa, or uh, coastal cloths in Ouida. And Ventura Ferreri Miles, also a barber and slave of the captain of the ship, wow. also purchased 49 of the same cloth and placed them in his own personal liberty chest. Meanwhile, on the San Miguel de Triunfante, a Bahian born slave, Domingos de Rosario, also a barber, possessed extensive and unusual holdings in his liberty chest. This included barrels of West African palm oil two dozen small and seven large corals, 11 straw mats, and two large and three lar uh, small panos da costa. So all of Rosario's holdings, palm oil, shells, straw mats, and West African cloth had liturgical applications in Brazil, particularly for the African-born population who circulated, consumed, and controlled the meanings attached to these objects. So once slaving vessels arrived in port, African market women, particularly mo mobile ganaderas, which are um, sort of wage-earning female slaves, um, and stationary quintanderas, who ran market stalls, would greet returning sailors. Um, and they leveraged, these women leveraged their social and ethnic connections to such men to monopolize the distribution of African goods in the city and beyond. So freed African mariner Lino Ricardo illustrates this point well. He lived together with his African-born wife, Rita de Peña de Franza, and their two children. So he noted that she owned several gold coins, um, which is unusual for um, um, freed African people. And perhaps she had accumulated these selling African wares in the streets of Bahia. In 1811, Ricardo had brought back from Africa a collection of Panos da Costa. So in the same period, Lucinda and Raimondo, which are also a freed African couple, who also resided, res, resided in the city along with their American-born daughter, Luisa, owned and operated a small shop which sold various styles of cloth, beads, clothing, gold embellished coral earrings, along with one quote, blue palo da costa. So many varieties of West African cloth arrived in Bahia, but most were, and here we see an, uh, a really good example of a pano da costa. So this is essentially what it looked like. It was a striped cloth. So most of these cloths were produced in Oyo and Ojevu. And they were strip woven, hand lubed on a vertical loom, um, and they were made of cotton, dyed in indigo. In Yoruba, they were called asooke, which is translated as cloth of the hill or heritage cloth. Um, there's also in the slaving ship manifest um, indications that aso alona, which is a kind of cloth with patterns or brocaded textiles, were also being imported on these ships. So these durable cotton textiles were crafted by female Yoruba artisans, and they flowed into the plantations of the Brazilian interior. They were moved by the initiative and ingenuity of a group of itinerant West African-born slaves and freed men and women. And despite the enslaved population's paltry resources, runaway slave advertisements reveal that the use of Panos da Costa was widespread among the men, women, and children of all African ethnicities in the city. This creolized African form of corporeal signification drew on West African conceptualizations of materiality. And in, the, in Yoruba speaking West Africa, textiles, and I think this is important because sometimes we understand these commodities in a very Eurocentric sense. But in Yoruba-speaking West Africa, textiles ontologically occupied the same position as oral praise performances, or Yoruban oriki, right? So 
they acted as very potent signifiers, and they were also a kind of wearable social document. So they connoted social status, prestige, belonging, as well as the material embodiment and link to one's ancestors. Like other sacred paraphernalia, cloth was imbued with ashe, or life force, aura, potentiality, to transform. And in Bahia, West African material culture became a site of intellectual production, as ideas about Panos de Costa evolved. So by the end of the 19th century, and I'll jump forward a little bit, um, by the end of the uh, 19th century, these cloths are still seen as an agent of force, right? But they also became a sort of specialized emblem for the feminized ritual leadership of Afro-Brazilian candomblé. So we see the West African <clears throat> use of the shoulder cloth here, and then we see the Brazilian iteration. This is actually the early 20th century um, by Maya Nina, who's one of the founders of a very illustrious uh, candomblé tejero. So, Essentially what we see, right, is that these cloths continue to signify and enact a connection, right? But this time to particular orishas, which are Afro-Brazilian deities, through a rich symbolism of color and design. So palm oil, shells, straw mats, right, all of these things transported on slaving ships also became crucial ritual offerings um, and elements of initiation ceremonies in na nascent candomblé worship, right? And it's important to say that Candomblé was actually created by free Africans, freed Africans in the city of Bahia. So thus it was this accessibility to African material culture that spurred new forms of African-inspired religiosity in Salvador. Also entangled in this emerging Afro-Brazilian ritual complex of the 19th century were uh, African-derived medicinal concepts and practice. So with a remarkable 90% of all slaving vessels uh, employing medical practitioners born in Africa, Barbers and sangredores um, drew on West African principles, right, as they partook in the diverse healing landscape of the city. We see an example here of a, a West African healer in Brazil. So during the late colonial period, the majority of the city's population was chronically ill, enslaved, and impoverished. Ailing Africans and Creoles often sought medical advice and treatment from respected lay healers, including curanderos, or curers, midwives, barbers, and sangredores, who drifted throughout the city or operated in small shops which dot dotted the urban landscape. African medical practitioners usually were less costly than academically trained European surgeons, so they were preferred by both the African people who lived in the city as well as by slaving ship merchants. <clears throat> Excuse me. So slaving ship merchants were also influenced by an 18th century medical consensus that Africans could better treat other Africans. Um, so this is really you know, paradoxical to how we think hierarchies of knowledge work. But for instance, in 1818, a Portuguese treaty stipulated that if, quote, surgeons do not sail on board such vessels on account of the improbability of procuring them or for some other reason, the owner should be obliged to carry with them black sangredores, experienced in the treatment of diseases with which the slaves are commonly afflicted and in the remedies proper for curing them. So the treaty reflected notions that African-born people differed um, sort of physically from African or Europeans because of differences in climate in the two regions. So according to 18th century understandings of race, um, theories of pathology, medical knowledge, um, blacks were thought to contract distinctive illnesses, which only other Africans understood how to treat. So as Susan Scott Parrish has argued for Anglo Americans, Portuguese merchants constructed African expertise spatially, topically, and temporally rather than an essential hierarchy of superior and inferior. Mm -hmm. So instead of insisting on the universal superiority of European physicians and European-derived methods of medical treatment, Europeans on the West African coast often defer to the greater expertise of African practitioners living there. Right. So in Brazil, acceptance and sometimes endorsement of heterodox medical practice was uh, facilitated by the perceived African familiarity with the ailments that were particularly widespread among the enslaved African population. Right, so indeed, the medical therapies most frequently employed on slaving vessels and in colonial Brazilian society had deep roots in both European and West African medical practice. Slaving ship merchant uh, medicine chests carried up to 50 medicinal substances, 
some of which were African derived, including Arabic gum, columba, and tamarind pulp. As medical supplies often decayed in the first half of slaving ship uh, journeys in tropical climates, practitioners were often forced to find alternatives on the West African coast with the aid of local peoples who were adept at healing. So a broadly defined West African medical practice, which utilized natural substances, a number of preparations, uh, was commonly drawn upon by slaving ship personnel, ships crews, and the enslaved while they were stationed on the West African coast. So for instance, a, a Danish clergyman says that on the Gold Coast, we quote, sometimes place ourselves in the hands of the Negroes, who also concern themselves with treating fever. They use a purgative agent, which is made of the bark of a certain tree, of warm baths in which there are various bitter and astringent herbs of cupping and bloodletting. West, uh, sorry, West, uh, Western European derived pharmacopoeia on slaving vessels relied on both plant and mineral based compounds. And medical personnel, such as African sangredores, were often tasked with fabricating preparations designed to treat yellow fever, dysentery, yaws, skin and respiratory infection, wounds, and other ailments with appropriate purgatives, tonics, teas, tinctures, plasters, and ointments. Many of these treatments were Iberian in origin, and they were based on a kind of Hippocratic Galenic method of physiology, which required humoral balance to restore health. Bleeding or the expulsion of stagnant blood by the opening of veins, blisters, or the application of leeches was just as critical as the application of medical substances to achieve uh, equilibrium. So the origins of bloodletting, right, were in Europe, partially, but they were also in Africa, right? So the African sangredores, who listed their art as bleeding, scarifying, applying, and uh, applying cups and leeches, right, also drew from practices they had been familiar with in Western Africa, right? So I want to, oh, before I, I talk about the map, I want to talk a little bit about this image, right? Because here we see an African medical practitioner using small cones made of ox horn, which was also a material commonly used for bloodletting in Western Africa, um, to bleed um, his patient. Um, essentially, we'd create a vacuum inside the horn, and that would um, uh, help uh, excavate the blood um, from a small cut that you would make on the, on the head, uh, the back, or the shoulders. <clears throat> so we know from other depictions besides this one that, quote, the African barber in Brazil was not only expert at shaving and cutting hair, but also drawing teeth, bleeding, and was also a musician. Um, this is one of the things that um, visitors to the city notice. So one man claims in 1845 that, quote, the musical talents of barbers were put to get good use. Whilst the master barber is performing any of the operations of his profession, his companions will endeavor to soothe the soul or drown the cries of pain, as the case may be. So this is a seemingly superfluous detail to us. Like, why does it matter that he's singing um, to his client? But I think that it reveals the rich connections between Bayan and West African medical practice, right? as well as corporeal understanding. So I've located descriptions of similar methods of bloodletting um, in several of the regions where um, West Africans came during the course of the slave trade. So the Bight of Benin, the Bight of Biafra, Biafra Congo, Angola, right? Um, and in the multi-ethnic environment of Salvador, and I mean multi-ethnic in the sense of multi-ethnic African, right? These disparate healing traditions coalesced into one as enslaved communities sought healing and relief socially. The process was indicative what, of what Suzanne Blier has called the propensity of African cultures to adopt, adapt, and innovate, and what Pablo Gomez has called the pragmatic malleability of black healers in the Caribbean. The use of speech as a part of bodily intervention and restoration evokes the healing rituals of the Yoruban Babalao, who activated the power of specific herbal medicines through performance of particular incantations. These puns and wordplay, quote, verbally link the names of the medicinal plants, the odu, or the sign of the ifa, which is a kind of designation, under which they are classified, and the anticipated healing effect. So in order to make the actual effect happen, you need to verbalize it. <clears throat> Crucially, African barbers' therapies 
reveal the importance of what historians of art have called the empowered word to healing techniques. The empowered word activated and channeled the latent asse or life force, which according to Yoruba speaking people's cosmologies resided in all humans, animals, plants, hills, rivers, and orisas. So as Roland Amkodun has noted, cutting, which is one of the primary, primary therapeutic methods of the barber, plays an important role in contemporary Yoruba healing practice. And it acts as a potent medicinal preparation right, which may be taken orally or absorbed through the blood in small cuts in designated places, such as on the tongue or the lips. Within the Yoruba healing complex, a say, a force of power to heal and restore, must be activated by verbalizing, visualizing, and performing the oriki of those things or beings whose powers are being harnessed. And you'll notice it's really interesting if you compare it to the cloth, Right, you have a movement of the same sort of idea across different medium, right? So cloth, speaking, um, action, right? And it's all part of one sort of uh, uh, complex. So without ohun, which is speech, voice, or the performed word, neither epe, which is the malevolent, uh, malevolent component of life force, nor ashe, which is the be uh, beneficent component of life force, can fulfill its mission. Thus the use of oral incantations in fact reveals the epistemological influences of these barbers' healing praxis, particularly the intersection between bodily health and the metaphysical world. So the conservation and deployment of African-derived healing knowledge, far from representing a kind of passive form of cultural retention, was indicative of the various ways that Afro-Brazilian mariners could leverage cultural capital to commercial ends. They were working on the slave trade after all and, mining, and, and sort of preserving the health of enslaved commodities. So barbers and sangredores were often highly valued and well compensated for their skilled labor. And they often comprised the most affluent and upwardly mobile contingent of black seafarers in the city. Frequently they utilized their expertise in the healing arts to amass fortunes large enough to purchase their own manly mission, to accumulate property, invest in the transatlantic slave trade, and become religious and military authorities in the city. So in conclusion, I want to return to this presentation's initial uh, theme. How does the focus on the South Atlantic inform our understanding of the Black uh, Atlantic? Right? How does it transform our understandings of the era of the slave trade and more broadly the Atlantic world? Firstly, the Southern Black Atlantic allows us to reevaluate the position of mariners in the Atlantic system which I argue made them more akin to West African brokers as described by Africanists such as George Brooks and Robert Harms than proletarian sailors such as those depicted by Marcus Rediger. Brokers or middlemen connected distant merchant communities and they were often defined by their ability to convert their cultural and linguistic flexibility and expertise into commercial capital. And many African mariners did this in, in Salvador, it's very clear. The prevalence of African and Creole mariners in this transatlantic circuit also challenges the interpretations of historians such as Philip Morgan and Stephanie Camp who contend that captivity or the absence of mobility define the experience of slavery. Moreover, tracing the distinctive path of West African commodities across the Atlantic invites scholars to develop newer, more inclusive models of transatlantic merchant capitalism. As I argue, the history of the transatlantic trade must recognize that the variety of small-scale commercial exchanges initiated by non-Europeans were guided by motivations distinct from crude capital accumulation, right? Other things such as social capital and cultural capital were far more important. Finally, my research fundamentally challenges existing categorical models for understanding the transition or transmission of African culture to the Americas. The history of Bayan mariners suggests that what scholars have labeled creolization or alternatively, African recreation, in the words of James Sweet, are inadequate concepts to interrogate the ongoing dynamic relationship between Africa and the Americas. Rather, understanding the maritime black Atlantic requires recognizing that creolization, acculturation, and the conservation of African epistemologies, knowledge, and material culture were not mutually exclusive processes, but rather simultaneous processes. Rather, black mariners' propagation of a diverse trade in African commodities could bo be both a tool of cultural survival and a mechanism of personal advancement in an American slave society. Ultimately, this study demonstrates that a series of economic incentives facilitated the dissemination of African material culture in the New World. Paradoxically, these incentives were built into the structure of the afro bayan slave trade itself. 
Thus, by historicizing, contextualizing cultural diffusion, we can recognize that African material culture did not simply survive passively, but instead facilitated the personal economic advancement of Africans in the diaspora. Understanding this process, I argue, is crucial to comprehending a more human account of the transatlantic slave trade and more broadly, the Black Atlantic. Thank you. That was fabulous. Was, was that live stream? I mean, it went out? That, that was so amazing. Thank you. If you'd said any of this in 1998, <laughs> when I did Wonders of the African World, as Cornell knows, and I talked about the African world and the slave trade, people tried to metaphorically lynch me now. <laughs> now, it's 20 years later, yeah. we accept the African world and the slave trade, unless you're just totally, you know, your head somewhere in some Afrocentric cloud. Um, and, but, but this crisscrossing, mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing, and it was constant. But one of the things that we used to say is, oh, but they didn't know how bad it was. Even for the people who admit that Africans sold other Africans to Europeans in the slave trade, they would say, oh, but they had no idea how terrible it was. And what you show is that people are crisscrossing all the time. What was the relationship, and what are the percentages between, of, of the mariner, the black mariners, mm -hmm who were enslaved and who were free. Yeah, so I can go back to um, a slide. I didn't go deeply into the numbers just because I thought having a stream of numbers being read out would not be particularly interesting. But you can see here, right, that of black mariners in the city, and this is from the 1811 to 1829 moment, um, you see that most of them are in fact, 59% are enslaved. 16% um, are formerly enslaved and 15% fi uh, are free and 10% is unspecified. Right, so we know that at least 60% are enslaved. Okay. Yeah. Good. Questions, comments? Alejandro, of course. Uh, wait for the microphone. No, no, uh, right behind you. <laughs> so, excellent talk, Mary. It was great. Um, I second everything that, that Skip mentioned. Uh, I have a couple of questions. One is, you ended with, um, sort of emphasizing the, the role of these um, black mariners as brokers rather than as proletarians a la, a la, mm -hmm. a la Redeker, a la Marcus Redeker, right? Yeah. But they were still workers. Oh yeah, oh, And yes. uh, I think it would be interesting to hear something about the social world of labor mm -hmm. for these people and mm -hmm. about the, you know, vessels can be brutal spaces, uh, work places, like Marcus would say, and, and the, the sort of technologies of control Mm -hmm. that were deployed to uh, subjugate and extract labor from these people. Uh, and, you know, that can go into many different ways, and mm -hmm. I don't know how much you've done with this. And then the other question is, you are making an intervention also on, uh, on this scholarship on slaves on the law in the Atlantic world, and, um, have, um, and you, you are deploying this very interesting notion of kind of uh, this opportunistic choice of jurisdictions, right? And um, is this something that we can perhaps extrapolate to the interior of, uh, mm. of the traditional jurisdictions that uh, people may perhaps use the same logic to uh, choose with uh, judges or justices to approach in North? It's, uh, you, you are intervening in a very big field there, and as you know, it's a very lively and sometimes contentious field. <laughs> yeah, thank you for this question. Um, so in terms of the world of labor, um, yeah, I mean, it's difficult to get at the coercion. I mean, it is true that they used physical coercion against both enslaved people held on cargoes and sailors themselves. So for instance, um, one uh, collection of slaving ship papers I looked at said, they were doing accounting of everything on the ship, and one of the things they said is, we have these um, irons, but they're not for slaves, they're for the sailors, right? So we don't know if that's necessarily the case, because this was during the suppression of the slave trade, and you're not supposed to have slave trading paraphernalia on your ship, um, but the fact that they thought that that was um, a plausible explanation Right means that you know you are sometimes using physical coercion, and I mean it's really difficult to get at some of these issues because oftentimes, you know, the archival material just doesn't address the violence on these slaving ships. Um, I mean, I, I 
I don't want to go too far with this argument, but I, I do think that essentially they saw employing you know, peop West Africans as a kind of uh, technique of control um, because um, you know, instead of violence, you know, there was this understanding that, that these people could be mediators and could potentially diffuse and also inform on. We do have examples of you know, enslaved mariners informing on rebellions. Um, that are happening amongst enslaved people in the cargo. And I only found one instance of an enslaved sailor participating in a rebellion by enslaved uh, men and women in the cargo. And then they jump on a ship and row back to Africa. So um, that was the one instance I found of that. Um, and in terms of coercion, I mean, I think they used incentives more. I mean, what I've seen in the archives is they used incentives more than coercion, right? So this ability to buy into the voyage I mean, you don't want the voyage to be derailed, essentially, if your wealth is on that voyage. And um, you know, you could say that, is this merchants trying to co-opt these men? I mean, certainly. But it's also the case that mariners are petitioning for this right to trade on voyages. You know, I have legal documentation of them trying to do that. So I mean, they, they saw it as something that was in their interests. And then in terms of the law, yeah, it's a bit of a challenge um, because there's not so many surviving, at least that I found, petitions of this kind. Um, but essentially, they were, they were meant to um, go to particular officials in order to claim this free soil provision. And oftentimes, I found that they ran to um, the Catholic Brotherhoods because those men had um, already experience um, with these kinds of legal petitions. So they would t take them oftentimes to the officials um, that they needed to see. Um, and how that transformed jurisdiction. So I wouldn't go as far as you know, other scholars who've argued that enslaved peoples may, uh, running away changed jurisdiction. I, I wouldn't go that far, but they do reform the law over time. right? It's always this sort of moving target. So after 1776, they essentially say sailors are you know, cut out from this. Um, but they still keep coming all the way up through the 1820s. Right? So it's, it becomes this sort of popular idea that you can you can, you can become free by stepping foot, foot on Portuguese soil. So I, I hope I answered your question. Yeah. And it was a church. No, if you were a sailor, I mean, they were, they were supposedly exempt from it. So oftentimes they would go and they would say, well, you know, I pulled a cable and I hoisted a sail, but I'm not really a sailor. You know, I, 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 you know this isn't my profession. So this ex exemption doesn't apply to me. Yeah, it's a very rich and illuminating paper. I just have a quick comment, I guess, and a question. Um, the comment is that I thought you made an interesting point about medicine and expertise. Mm -hmm. I thought, in addition to the fact that African doctors sometimes treated African people or Europeans sometimes let African doctors treat them, I think it's also worth pointing out that in the 19th century, what it meant to be a successful doctor overall yeah. largely relied on like your track record as a doctor and not like as it would be later your your pedigree or something like yeah. that. Which means, which is why also enslaved women in the U.S. South were seen as like experts in obstetrics because they had delivered so many babies and things like that. So mm -hmm. I think in general, if these doctors had treated a lot of people, they'd be seen as great doctors independently of their status at times, you know? But um, the question I want to ask is, picks up on this idea of the law. Um, as you were talking, I thought to myself, I wondered when there were the highest numbers of enslaved people or people of African descent as sailors. And you mentioned the 18th century as this pivotal period, I presume because as the numbers of the slave trade go up, at the height of the slave trade, they're the highest number of sailors needed. But I also, you know, we, we noticed that a lot of the laws passed around enslaved people, like not being able to dress as white people, mm -hmm. or all these laws that sort of um, are passed to try to differentiate between people of African descent and whites or Europeans are, are probably precisely because the, the boundaries can be so porous at times. You know? So I wondered, do you think there's a relationship between these laws and these sailors, right? Are these sailors implicated in these kinds of laws? Do you find that in places where sailors are docking and mixing with the population that, does it coincide with that? You know, like, do you see a relationship between those kinds of laws and these kinds of practices? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I've never thought about the link to sumptuary laws. So generally, in Brazil, the sumptuary laws were 17th century, so a little bit before I'm talking, and they, and they generally tend to target actually African women that were dressing too ostentatiously. So that, I think, was more about, uh, you know, there's a wonderful scholar at Overland who's making this sort of argument for colonial Mexico. So, uh, so essentially, it's like you don't want, you know, these women who are actually quite upwardly mobile because they have this access to commerce to be able to 
pass as white women of some prestige. So that's why you have the Sumptuary White Laws. But it's interesting with regards to the sailors, it is very amorphous. And this you know, boundary between slavery and freedom, you know, people often ask me, well, did enslaved people run away when they were, when they were going on? when they were acting as mariners on these voyages. And I found few examples of that. Oftentimes they would leave the jurisdiction, right? Going back to the question of jurisdiction, and they would jump onto a French or a British ship. But you find a lot of people who are enslaved on plantation escaping to become sailors. Um, so I found runaway slave ads, for instance, in Rio de Janeiro, where an enslaved man runs away and his, his owner puts this ad in the paper that says, he dresses this way, he dresses like a sailor, and he's accustomed to acting as if he's free. Right, so I mean, I mean, it's about a, a sense of self-possession, right? So I think even more than the sort of clothing or the sort of external, I mean, it's this idea that you can be this sort of self-possessed person, um, and, and and because this is a, a, a laboring space which have both free and enslaved laborers, you can pass as free, but it also goes the other way, right? You can be enslaved, you know, if you're on this ship too. I mean, you're always vulnerable to be re-enslaved. Um, yeah, Mary, this is just incredible research, and I think it obviously speaks to all of these literatures on slavery and the law in the Americas, but also is a really important book for people interested in West African history. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, to bring it like back across the ocean, I mean, one thing I just wanted to hear a little bit more about, and I think others in the audience would, is who were these folks that ended up being the black mariners? I mean, you talked about mm -hmm. many of them coming from the Bight of, of, of Bahia, um, but, I mean, are they coming from a lot of different places? You know, I'm just kind of curious about the sort of, um, you know, particularly ethnic backgrounds. And, and I'm also just wondering, too, um, you know, it seems that we don't really have a lot of great accounts in West African history about these sort of maritime cultures. I mean, we have these sorts of zooming back from 18th, 19th century ethnographic accounts about um, mariners on the West African coast and then people kind of you know, so I'm wondering what some of this, some of the sources that you have coming out of Brazil and Portugal might also be telling us, you know, in going in different directions perhaps even than your particular project, but what they might be telling us about these, these mariner cultures in the West African coast that haven't really received much attention in the scholarship. So, yeah, I'd just love to hear more. Oh, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question. I can go back to the slide um, where it has their ethnic, oh, yeah, okay. So this is the sort of ethnic breakdown um, in terms of long distance uh, or deep water um, uh, maritime communities, right? And you can see most of them are from, so Mina, which was this kind of general term for people from the Mina coast, um, Nago, which essentially uh, corresponds to contemporary Yoruba, um, Hausa, Jeje, which is like contemporary Fon, right? So a lot of them are coming from this very particular part of the, the Mina coast. Um, and I mean, I think, so I think it's a complicated question because a lot of the documents that I have from their own perspectives um, are testimonies given to British um, courts. So they're very formulaic. <laughs> um, they're just sort of like, you know, I went here, I did this, I saw this. No, we weren't participating in the slave trade. I don't, sometimes they would sort of break the script and be like, yes, we were participating. And, you know, and sort of inform on, on, on the ship. But um, so I found a few references to men who said they were born in Wida. Um, so you can kind of narrow it down a little bit more than, than Mina, which is such a general one. Um, and I don't go into this too much just because, you know, I really focus on the sort of deep water sailing aspect. But if you look at the, 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 the bay itself, I mean, Africans are basically organizing the entire maritime infrastructure there. I mean, I have one chapter on this, but I feel like it's just scratching the surface. So for instance, there's this man named, uh, I believe is Juan de Brito, who's operating the early 18th century. And he's the captain of the jangadas, which are the rafts um, that are conveying goods and people. And he's African, right? Um, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to find out very much about him other than the fact that apparently the Portuguese colonial authorities were like telling all the sailors, like, you have to obey this man. Um, so there are these, I do get a sense from reading this, uh, the sort of descriptions of what um, West African people are doing within the Bay of All Saints itself, that they had certain <coughs> ideas about laboring hierarchies, that they had certain kinds of laboring rituals they were partic participating in, um, that they saw seafaring as a kind of like collective, right? So they would 
you know, steer or navigate these massive canoes with, you know, 10 rowers, and then they have these elaborate sort of choreographies in order to navigate the ship, um, you know, and, and, and to me it's really hard to nail down where that stuff came from, but it's like, you know, you just sort of think like, well, obviously the Europeans aren't going on the canoe and like teaching them how to do all this stuff, right? And, I, you know, there's been wonderful work um, done, you know, about these sort of local maritime cultures in West Africa, and I just find it so reminiscent of what I see in Bahia, but it's very hard to, to nail down with and say, like, this person came from this part of West Africa and was doing this. Okay, uh, thanks Mary for a great talk. It was really interesting. So it's really far outside of my area, but I am gonna tie it into something <laughs> I do because that's what we do as academics, um, selfishly, right? Um, and so I'm wondering if you could maybe, or if you think that the position of mariners had any impact on the development of like more contemporary myths about race in Brazil, particularly the myth mm. of racial democracy, um, the debate about, you know, back and forth about racial categorization and who, yeah. you know, who's discriminating against who, et cetera. No, that's an excellent question. I've been thinking about that a lot lately just because of you know, a contemporary political moment right now in Brazil. Um, so what would their relationship be? I mean, I mean, it is the case that you know, it is simply not, I feel like the racial ideology that is governing um, colonial and then early imperial Brazil is just not the North American um, model. And I mean, I do have instances in which insla uh, black sailors say like, you know, I was treated this way because I was black. I was, you know, so they do, they do see race as a part of their life. But what I see from the documentation is that they understood that they were being classified according to their race, right? And that there was a, a, a racial hierarchy in operation, but that they themselves did not have a very strong sense of racial consciousness at this time period. Um, they were more likely to have sort of a sense of ethnic consciousness, a sense of, like, you know, within your ship, you have a sense of solidarity with the members of your ship. You have a sense of solidarity with the people in your patronage network that is in Bahia. Sometimes you become the head of that patronage network if you're one of these very successful um, sangredores or barbers um, um, who owns a house and, and is, in, is married. Um, so for, for me, for them, it's, it's they don't, I don't think they see themselves as sort of, or they understand they're racialized, but that's not an internalized um, sense for themselves. And, I mean, it is true that there is not the same sort of barrier to a certain kind of upward mobility for a, a very small portion of people, right? I don't want to overestimate the vast majority of Africans who are arriving in Brazil are going to be dying in, you know, diamond mines and, 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 and tobacco and, and sugar plantations. But there is going to be this small minority that can have some sort of upward social and economic mobility. So yeah, I think, may, I think that does. I mean, I think that does in some way legitimize this idea of racial democracy. Thank you. <laughs> uh, a very interesting aspect uh, of uh, Afro-Atlantic diaspora. And uh, I'm very curious about gender, maybe escaping mm -hmm. information, Maybe you have talked, but maybe I didn't understand very well. But why I am uh, curious about gender? I am a Bayana. I'm from Salvador, Are the Bahia. You? Yeah. And uh, I think you know, no? Candomblé in Bahia and, uh, is a city of women, no? Yeah. Dominance woman. And I'm not an expert in uh, African medicine. But of course, as Bayana, I know some secrets. <laughs> uh, but in Bahia, Candomblé use more plants, roots, and there's some elements of the natural uh, water, no? and the rocks, things like this. And I never, never in my life hear 
about uh, the use of cornies. Oh, really? And it, oh. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Amazing information for me. So my question is, if in your research, uh, if you detect if this practice in Africa was well, well, used uh, by women too, mm -hmm. or just by men, and the, this practice, it maybe died in Bahia. I don't know if mm -hmm. it died or not, but I, I never hear about it. Because it stopped the movement of the black marinas. That's my question. Yeah, no, thank you for that. That's really fascinating. Yeah, I've given a lot of thought to this. So in this sort of longer exposition of this African um, sort of healing tradition that I see going on in Bahia, um, in the West African context, yeah, women are very important medical practitioners. Um, and also, you know, e even if we bring it to the sort of religious or spiritual, I mean, they're really important spirit mediums, right? And like, and, 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 and like you said, a lot of, you know, women's power and ritual knowledge is seen as like secret, you know, especially if we're looking at like the Dahomeyan tradition, right? This idea like, oh, women are more powerful than men, but like nobody knows because it's all secret. Um, <laughs> so I do see in Bahia, even though I don't, necessarily addressing this in my pro project, pretty much all the midwives are, 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 are African and Creole women, right? So you do have this um, gender division of, of medical labor that is not faithful to the West African context. That is something that's very much, so that's one thing that, you know, one way in which the Bayan healing practice really diverges, right, is because barbers and sangredores are seen by Portuguese authorities as men, right, and, and slaveholders specifically purchase enslaved people for this purpose to train them as barbers. I mean, there is just, there's just no way to translate that sort of more um, gender fluid dynamic healing um, tradition from West Africa to Brazil in that sense. But in Cantomblé, yes, it's certainly true that most of the founders, the early founders of Cantomblé, uh, it's really interesting because uh, Luis uh, Nicolau Pérez makes this argument, are either, oh, this most of the early founders of Candomblé either have an, if some sort of association to barbering. They're West Africans who are barbering, and they're either working on these slave ships and going back and forth, or they're merchants and they're going back and forth, or they're these free women, African women in the city. And I believe, I mean, I, I, I sort of presented what I have, but I believe that they have connections to these mariners, either conjugal or other kinds of connections. Uh, up on yours, uh, and I missed the first half, oh. but but I told you I would. Yes, okay. Uh, but but Skip's comment about traffic going both ways, your reflections about uh, barbers and music uh, takes me back to West Africa, the connections between religion, music, spirit possession. Mm. Talking about how the same slave ships will bring raffia mats and uh, cloth and palm oil, et cetera, et cetera. But it takes me to the sacred landscape of healing. Mm. And, and, and how African healers, you talked about rocks, bodies of water, groves, plants that are brought, but the, the processes by which healers begin to either recognize or create that landscape of healing that is central to their practice and how these slave ships going back and forth it brings ideas, brings symbols, brings materials, brings individuals yeah. that feed into that. From 1850, the slave trade effectively begins to end yeah. for Brazil. With that, so the post-1850, what then is the impact on this body of knowledge, this landscape that is emerging? Yeah, thank you, that's a wonderful question. Um, so I, I see my, so my work, I think, is building off of, for instance, work done by people like Laurent Latore, who I think does a really wonderful job of, um, in Black Atlantic religion, right, of, of, of essentially sketching out <laughs> this flow of people after the Malay revolt, right, after you have this xenophobic backlash. So the Malay revolt was a, um, 
uh, a revolt that happens in South Florida in 1835 uh, by African freedmen essentially, but also in some enslaved people. And also sailors are also participating in this too. Uh, when we talk about the African orientation of these men, they're also participating in this sort of uh, ethnic revolt that's happening in the city. So after that, um, you see people going back to West Africa. Some of them set themselves up as, um, as merchants in West Africa, and they specialize essentially in the buy-in trade, and they're also ritual practitioners at the same time. Right? So the, there's this kind of simultaneity that I think Matori does a great job of sketching out, and one of the reasons why I think these goods become so central to, to um, candomblé religious devotion right, is because that is how these people are surviving, essentially, right? um, is by tra trafficking these goods, and I, I see a continuation after 1835 of these same transatlantic currents, um, but I just don't see mariners playing the same role, largely because of the supp suppression of the slave trade. Also, you know, at a certain point, you know, Bayans are like, we need to whiten this labor force because these Africans are too seditious. Um, so I mean, that put, I mean, so people can't travel as freely after 1835. Um, but they still travel. I mean, so I, I see this, this circularity continuing far past, but I think my contribution is essentially saying these African mariners are the sort of beginning of it, or the sort of, you know, what grows into um, a larger tr um, transatlantic circuit. Um, does that answer your question? Um, yeah. I want to thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank you so much because you've taught me a lot. I don't know much about Brazil in all honesty, and especially um, about the slave system in Brazil. I, I, obviously, I know more about what have happened to, to us here. So this question might be completely off, but um, I promised you I was going to give you my first yeah. question. Yeah, no, I'm answer. happy. I'm, I'm looking forward um, to it. <laughs> so my question is this. I'm wondering, like, when you have a person, like an enslaved black mariner who mm -hmm is able to, um, you know, be an officer, like to hold rank, to travel a great distance. Uh, it sounds like, from what I'm hearing, that there was no systemic attempt to prevent the reproduction of West African culture yes. in the same way that we may have sure. experienced here. Yes. So I'm saying, when you're in the midst of all of that, it's like your day-to-day -day lived experience challenges this the mythology of white superiority. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how does that inform in the day-to-day -day, um, like dynamic, the relationship between master and slave? Mm. No, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, I'm gonna have to think on that, I think. <laughs> um, so I, basically, I see the relationship between uh, masters and slaves, especially involving these mariners uh, in this space, as being very much a sort of patron-client um, relationship. Um, and I mean, I don't want to minimize, you know, violence or exploitation or any of these things. But essentially, the idea, right, in this sort of fluid space, is that eventually you can earn your freedom, you can manumit yourself, and then hopefully you become a patron, right? So I mean, it work. It functions very much in the way that we think patronage systems work. And one of the things that these mariners, I think, are very good in doing is establishing their own sort of um, independent sort of centers of power if they're able to work the system, right? So some of the men I talked about, Ventura Ferreira Miles, for instance, he goes on to become a trader, right? And then he has clients, right, that he controls and he has a household that he controls. So it's not a sort, it's not a sort of, you know, sense of pushing back on that, you know, I'm rejecting this whole sort of ideological edifice of white supremacy in this very sort of conscious, you know, way that we might maybe want from the politics of these people. Um, but they are able to sort of navigate in the system and create these sort of independent, I think, social and cultural networks that, you know, are the sort of um, scaffolding of this Afro-Brazilian community. Oh, it's very rich, so thank you so much, though. Your meticulous scholarship, I think, is quite, uh, not just impressive, but in many ways overwhelming. But I want to get back to Skip's point, because Skip got in trouble. 
because he was, had the courage to tell painful truths about black complicity to one of the greatest crimes against humanity in the modern world. And that was the dialogue. You remember that 20 years ago? Ooh, he had to get some security for that, brother. Oh, yeah. now, but these pain, because truth cuts a number of different ways. But I, I, I want to ask you the question, what do you say to those who would say, well, you're highlighting this creative complicity of these functionaries to one of the greatest crimes of the modern world. I mean, Hannah Arendt had the same challenge when she talked about Jewish councils right. that facilitated one of the greatest crimes in the modern world in terms of the Holocaust and so forth. Because we have to be truth tellers, but we also have to recognize what kind of impact this is, especially in a neo-fascist moment that we live in today, where you want to accent black creativity to complicity as the black masses are continually being subordinated, trashed, dismissed, degraded, and so forth. So what, 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 what do you say? And that's a larger kind of meta comment, but what, what, what would you say? Because you and Skip going to have similar space, and I, I, believe, I believe in truth telling. We've got to tell the truth. But, but what, what do you say? But also, what's the, what's the legacy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, the legacy, and Emmanuel and I have talked about this extensively, the legacy of this class of people yeah. in Africa right. who participated in the slave trade and then continued to be wealthy in Africa and who are still wealthy today, many of the ruling families, many of them are mulattoes because one of the things in, in many uh, regions that a very clever um, control of the slave trade made Europeans do was marry a daughter. And so and it was a mulatto class that then uh, predominated the slave trade. The slave trade is a hell of a lot more complicated than roots. And that diagram that we've all seen, it, it was very important. Um, and that's our image of slavery, but it was a lot more complicated than that. Anyway, yeah. go ahead. No, no, thank you both for those really excellent comments and questions. I mean, I have to say, this is something I struggle with a lot. And I try to think about my ethical responsibility because I mean, you know, at a certain point, you're, you're a scholar out here and you're like, oh, I wanna find something that you know, challenges the conventional wisdom because that's good for my career. But also, what is your, you know, beyond that, what is your ethical responsibility as a scholar? I mean, I guess I would say in my own work, I think that this story does say something about the operation of power, um, which is that, you know, power is both coercion and consent. I mean, I mean, I guess, you know, and I would say. That'd be a great title. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a great title for this book. So yeah, so I do, I do really want, you know, I, I, I try to be careful with my work not to present myself as a slave trade apologist or say that, you know, or say that what's going on here is good in some way, but I mean, it is good in the sense that people had to do what they had to do to survive, right? <laughs> and, but beyond that, right, it's recovering a sense of the self beyond just the sort of physical survival, which is why they're building these networks, which is why they choose to decorate their body in this way, why they choose to participate in these sort of communal African he you know, healing um, traditions. So you know, I would say that these people are behaving, I think, as we all do in systems of power, right? Responding to both coercion and consent. And I, I mean, I hope that people see them as humans and recognize you know, something about their own positionality through hearing about them. And that they were just as complicated as we are. Yeah. Right? Let's give it up. Mary Hicks. <laughs> Fabulous president. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.